because like I said, most of the time when people say they don't want to get married, it's because of what they've seen. Yeah. So what we always press upon couples that are out here and that are happily married is we need you to be vocal, to lift your voice, no matter who you are, what cultural background, ethnic background, we need you to lift your voice and be visible because when couples aren't happy, who do they tell? Everyone. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Marriage is wonderful. It certainly should be that way. Um, God honoring, and it's the institution he created for us to love and live together in. But it's so sad to see it devalued in the culture, sometimes by circumstances, sometimes by choice. But we're hearing that more and more millennials uh, for example, are choosing to stay single yeah. far longer and not get married in large part because of what they've seen their parents go through. But let's talk about the biblical application, how we have better marriages, what we can do in blended family to bring two different families together and how we get through that. And we have some guests along with us today to help us unpack this and address this. Uh, they are Lamar and Ronnie Tyler, and uh, they are passionate about displaying uh, some of the things you talked about there, Jim, the value, the power, and and the beauty of a godly marriage. You know, I've never uh, put this together, but let me quote King David in the Psalms who wrote, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. I like that. And today we're going to hear their story, uh, Lamar and Ronnie. Welcome to Focus on the Family. Thank you. Thank you. We it's eventually to got to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we like to do that setup to kind of set uh, the stage, the table, uh, for folks as they're listening to say, okay, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, let's get into it. When you decided to get married, your friends and family, I think they rolled their eyes and said, no, you guys got to think about it. Why would your friends and family members say that to you? Well, I think it just hits right on what you were speaking about a minute ago. We meet and we've seen in our own lives so many people that have negative viewpoints of marriage because of what they've seen around them. Mm -hmm. And they've seen uh, our broken marriages. They've seen broken families. They themselves may have been through divorce. And a lot of times they like to project that same type of feeling onto newer couples when they'll come into the room and say, hey, we're getting married. And they'll say, well, uh, hold on just a second. Don't make the same mistake we made. Right. Or we don't want to see you go down the same path that I went through. And they're projecting some of their own things onto you. So that's really one of the reasons we wanted to start the site. We even just started having this kind of conversation between ourselves to say that we have to really be able to celebrate couples that want to get married, they want to go into the covenant of marriage, and not just celebrate the fact that they want to get married, but then once they get married, really wrap our arms around them, love on them, and then support them. You know, one of the things I think in the Christian community we have really failed at is to project uh, healthy, but not perfect. And what I mean by that yes. is there aren't perfect marriages. There's probably really good marriages that click and they work well together. They probably rarely argue. They resolve conflict in a healthy way. And those are healthy marriages. But many, many marriages, Christian or non-Christian, you hit points where you're just, you know, you're struggling. You might argue about something or you have a fight about something. What do you think of that idea of being real and, and as opposed to projecting something perfect? Right. Um, we definitely see that a lot with the church. I think a lot of people um, want to project things one way on Sunday. We're the perfect family. But when you get in the car and you're on the way home, all arguing. hell is breaking her. <laughs> and, and you're arguing. And um, and so we we definitely see that. We want, um, especially people in the church, to, to also, you know, to, to, to apply biblical principles to the, to the marriage. I think that's basically what keeps us together. You know, when we go to church on Sunday, I'm really focused on how can I be a better person, a better Christian, and that helps our marriage. But a lot of times, they're still not applying the practical. Um, they're not applying some of the things that we're learning in marriage education um, sessions and things that people can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis to improve communication, you know, to in improve conflict management. And so just kind of marrying the two and not just kind of keep keeping that separate and also just breaking down those walls yeah. um, and, being, and, and being real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. What, what's an example of that so people can catch it? Just, a, uh, you know, a story or something that you rem remember? Well, if I could, I think something we see oftentimes, we hear even through the site, through our, you know, social media channels, is we'll see couples that are going through it, and it can be infidelity, a lack of communication, money issues, and they'll say, um, we're going through all this stuff, but, um, you know, all I need is my Bible, and we'll work it out, 
right? We don't need to go see a therapist. We don't need to talk to uh, the marriage ministry or somebody like that. Just my Bible alone is all I need. And one of the things we share with them is that when you break your arm, you know, do you just lay the Bible on that arm and say, this is all I need to heal? Or do you go see a doctor? Because God has blessed us with people that know more than we know, that have insight right. in certain areas, and that can help us heal. Well, it's the same thing with your marriage. There are people put on this earth that God has blessed with knowledge, with opportunity, with insight that can help your marriage heal and go from where it is today to where you dreamed it could be. Mm -hmm. And to also know, I love one of the things that Ronnie always talks about is that um, oftentimes, and especially in the church, people think there are only two options in your marriage. Can you share that, Ronnie? Right. So, yeah, just to, to stay and be miserable or to leave, right, versus how about staying and being happy and just working on it. Yeah, there you and, go. And, the, and third the, yes, yeah. Exactly. the third option. Yes, exactly. the third option, right? I like so, that. That's so, so yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lamar, you and I have similar backgrounds in that we, we come from broken homes. My mom and dad divorced when I was five. And so I share that pain, and then my mom remarried a few years later, and that was not good with a stepdad. And then she died when I was nine, and stepdad walked out of the family. A lot of turmoil. And, uh, and you have a background of divorce with your parents, I believe. Is that yes, right? Yes, correct. H how did that impact you? Share that uh, bit of that story with us. You know, it, it, for me, it was very hurtful as a child, and it was something I had to really learn to release and just, just, um, which is, was blessed with just forgiveness in a lot of ways to now I don't harbor a lot of pain and hurt. And for me, what it looked like, you know, I, I knew who my father was. He always was around. He's a, a, a police officer, you know, in the local oh, so, area. Okay, so he was regimented. I mean, yeah, exactly, you know. Uh, rule follower. Yeah, Vietnam veteran and worked wow. to the police force and worked the police force from the time he got out of the Marine Corps until he retired. Mm -hmm. So, you know, upstanding <laughs> citizen yeah. and everything. But yeah. he remarried and had two daughters of his own. And I think as he just kind of grew that family, the kind of communication. And I think that's something that, that once families separate, that people forget that, hey, keeping that communication is not necessarily an easy thing, but it's a necessary thing. How old were you, Lamar, when your parents divorced? I was thinking I was about three years old. Oh. So I never really remember. I don't really have kind of memories of him then. really yeah. being in the home with me because I was too young. All my memories are from him early on yeah. when he would come pick us up on the weekends and spend time and take us to Virginia Beach to go fishing and things like that. But... As I got older and his family started to grow, um, the, that communication kind of lessened. And I remember, what I do remember is my 11th birthday, I believe, was the, the first time I didn't get a call on my birthday. Oh. And that hurt and that pain. and Feeling forgotten. Yeah, feeling forgotten. I think, I think that definitely was it. And it probably wasn't until I was late in my teens, maybe, maybe, maybe 17, 18, or maybe even early 20s. But I remember having a conversation with my brother, I'm the youngest of three. And I remember having a conversation with uh, uh, the middle brother, the one right above me, and somehow we started talking about my father. And he talked about the fact that um, he didn't kind of harbor ill will towards him. He had to just let it go. Uh -huh. and, and how, you know, harboring that ill will wasn't uh, allowing him to live his best life, right, and allowing him to do better. And it really just kind of sparked something inside of me that eventually I was just able to kind of let it go. And now when I see him, you know, I'm excited to see him. Not too long ago, um, you know, um, I actually was out of town. Ronnie and I were out of town, but my mother had taken the girls from Atlanta, where we live at now, back up to the D.C. area, and she connected with him so I, I, uh, my daughters could see him and spend some time yeah. with him. But I, in a lot of ways, I figure he just, he just does the best that he can do, right? Um, yeah. You know, I pray for him. And it's I a forgiving heart, but all of that had to shape you know, you're 20-somethings. I mean, you're, you're thinking, will I get married? Should I get married? That fear factor that you talk about. And, and what was that like when Ronnie caught your eye and you're thinking, okay, maybe this is a girl I could marry? Did you fear the idea of marriage? I didn't fear the idea of marriage. I always felt like I wanted to be married. And I don't know. So the, you had confidence about yeah, it, I had confidence. that you could do it better than what you saw your dad do? Yeah, and part of that may have been because I saw my grandparents married. So even though my father wasn't there, okay. we talk about the fact that the patriarch of my family was my grandfather. So you had that stable model. So I had that, yeah. And everything I modeled from what to be a man, I modeled from, you know, Maurice Adams Sr. Because mm. I saw him being a man with our family. I saw him being a financial supporter. I saw him being a, 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 um, a financial leader, a spiritual leader. I saw that when in our church he was the chairman of the deacon board and uh, when they were in the transit between pastors, he kind of ran everything at the church and was a pillar in the community. So yeah. he was the person always wanted to grow up to be. Yeah. And and when he passed away, I remember, um, you know, at his funeral, just thinking like, this is the kind of life I want to live, a life of honor, a life where other people respect you for what you've done. So I never had really concerns about marriage, probably more so, I'm sure we'll get into this, but when I got married, I had a lot more concerns about getting divorced than I did actually about getting married. And a lot of that came up later 
through blended family issues, other marital kind of yeah. issues. And I just always would think, are these the things that lead to divorce? Because that's what I didn't know. I, you see people get divorced, but you never really know what that path is that takes yeah. them there. It's just, the why. It's just, you know, you think they're the perfect couple, then all of a sudden one day you hear that they're separated. Ronnie, let me turn to you because I think you, you represent so much of the modern era, if I could say it that way, mm -hmm. where you made some decisions, uh, describe those for us. I think when you were 19, mm -hmm. having your first child, take us through uh, those 20 something years and describe for us what you were living. Right. Um, yeah, so I was definitely not living the, the life that my parents, <laughs> you know, hoped for. And um, it, you know what? A lot of people are there, so it's okay to share it. It will yeah. help us. Yeah, you know, my father, he's actually a pastor. He has um, a church in Virginia, and coming up, he was, you know, a deacon um, in the church. He actually started his own church when Lamar and I, the year we got married. But um, so, yeah, I did. Um, I had my first child at 19. And um, I still, you know, we didn't get married. I was in college. I was in undergrad. Um, and I, I stayed, it was not a good relationship, but I stayed with that person the entire time, through my entire 20s. Mm -hmm. What were you, if um, I can ask, I mean, to help some woman that might be in that same spot right now, what were you thinking? What were you counting on? What did you think that relationship would, would blossom into? You know, I, 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 I felt like I was just really immature. I wasn't listening. All of the signs said, this is not a good relationship, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, you're this, smart, this, you're in college. I'm in college. Yeah. Um, I I did undergrad. I had a full scholarship. I did graduate school. I had a full scholarship, engineering. Mm. Um, I'm in college. I'm on this path. And I was actually in a relationship with someone that had dropped out of high school, you know, just just doing, you know, odds and ends and all the things that my parents said, hey, look out for. Right. And I just kept, I was like really being proud. And um, if they were to come and they were to say, hey, Ronnie, like, look, this is not good. This is not the person. You just don't mm -hmm. like him. You you know, like, right. all, the defense <laughs> all, the, yeah. all of the defensiveness. Yeah. Um, and just, um, so when my parents came around, putting up this air of like, we have this great relationship, but when they were gone, you know, we were breaking up a lot. I wasn't really necessarily happy, but when they came around, you know, just our problems are between us. So mm. just not letting them on, letting, letting on. And that went on for a while until I was on, in my late 20s. And um, what happened is I got pregnant again. Mm -hmm. So I had two ch children with, with the same person. So I was in this, this relationship. I had also convinced myself that marriage didn't matter. I literally convinced myself. That was just so a piece of paper. I did. Yeah. I did. I said, oh, a wedding's not important. Not, that's not what I saw because my parents were married. Um, and because I lowered my um, expectations based off of my relationship. And I see some people saying that. And I always question women. I don't like marriage. I don't like this. And I, 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 I always ask them why. I said, I convinced myself that marriage didn't matter when I was in a bad relationship because I didn't want to marry that person. And I didn't just, I didn't have the words to, I just didn't know how to connect it. Mm. As soon as I got out of that relationship, I remember making that decision when I had um, my second child to say, I, I need to choose me. And I I always, even though I had bad relationship um, decisions, I always stayed like, on a straight and narrow. I, I graduated college with honors. I worked. I bought a house. I always like took care of my business. But I decided I'm going to put my house for, up for sale. And I did as soon as I had that baby. And I put my stuff in storage and I went and moved with my mom, moving, moved in with my parents because I could work from home. And I just had to take a, I had to make a break. What mm. it, Was it to find a, a safe place, a better place? I um, needed to be start around my family wow, and I to, to get decision. out of the relationship. It was not a good relationship and yeah. I needed to be around positive people and to just have that support of my family. And I remember just like getting back into my childhood church. I worked in the nursery. I just like kind of like worked on myself and my relationship with God and just like get got back to like the values that I had growing up, like just with my family. Yeah. Let me it's, ask you this because this is really good. A lot of Christian parents have a 20 something child that might be living right where you were at mm -hmm. back then. What advice do you have for them as parents of that 20 something who's maybe living with somebody? 
And they're, you know, they're in a Christian home and they're going, wow, where did we go wrong with our daughter? Right. What happened with our son? Why are they living like this? And frankly, uh, in this day and age, 20-somethings cohabiting is more common than marriage right now. Right. Um, I, I really appreciate my parents. I really appreciated that they, they took a step back. Um, they never, they never compromised their values. So if, if I, even though I had a child with this man, if I came to Virginia to, to stay with them, we were not staying in their home. We were not staying in a bedroom together. Which probably they upset never, you then, but now you yes, appreciate it. They, they <laughs> never compromised their values, yet they still stayed connected with me hmm. without compromising their values. And as soon as I was ready, they, they, they pulled me in. And that's what I appreciated because the more they fought, the more I fought against it. You know, and so yeah. that's that's advice that I would give parents, you know, you know, love them from a distance, you know, stand don't your compromise ground. your values, stand your ground. And when when they came around, it's, it was still you're not married. I'm not recognizing this. You, you know, when we, if we went on vacation, hey, you all need to have separate hotel rooms. They never compromised the entire time. Let's move into the marriage and the mm-hmm. blended family situation, sure. because I think there's so much good to uh, learn from your mm-hmm. experiences there. So you have the two children, you get married. I believe your youngest, your daughter, mm-hmm. uh, really started calling you daddy at two years old and and there was no problem. But your older son, nine at the time or 11-ish? Mm-hmm. So about 11. 11. About 11. A yeah. little more difficulty there. And, and again, your story is in part everybody's story. So that's mm-hmm. why I appreciate you sharing this. But there was some more difficulty there, right? Yeah, it, it definitely was more difficulty. And I think a lot of for him was... You know, okay, here's this new man coming into the coming into the family, and he's, you know, telling me what to do and how to do it and all these type of things like that. And I think at the same time, you know, he was going through preteen, oh yeah, teenager time, is which is guy? which is with the <laughs> biological dad. He probably was still saying, "Hey, this guy here trying to tell me what to do." Yeah, <laughs> he shouldn't be telling me what to do. So, well, in fact, friends of his, even kids, were telling him, "You don't need to listen to exactly. this dad because he's not your real dad." Exactly, and we saw a lot of that. How and did it, you address that with him? Did you ever have a chance to sit and talk with him about that? You know, I I did. And looking back at it, definitely some things I wish I would have done differently because I think probably like a lot of men do right the bravado and the macho is right. you know my, my my stance was more so that okay i don't have to be your dad but i still demand respect yeah and it was more almost like like that military type of thing of like okay you don't have to call me dad you have to love me like a dad but you do have to respect me and while i still did demand respect i still wish there would have been some other things i could have done mm-hmm. to show him love in different ways well to earn the respect exactly i hear what you're saying exactly but that's so good how about you as mom watching this that you have to have a bit of anxiety about yeah. how my kids are going to relate to yeah. Lamar, my husband now, their father. I mean, to say the least. Um, but when we were, in, when I was engaged and leading up to the marriage, I never n- once thought, hey, I'm going to be in a blended family. This is going to be a step family. Those words didn't even come hmm. in, in, into my thoughts. I just, and I, I didn't prepare myself for the situation. I didn't prepare for myself for Lamar being the stepdad. Like, it just, it all totally just kind of blindsided me. I did not talk to my son. I did not ask him how he would feel about the situation or reassure him. I just uh-huh. thought, this is a good guy. This is good for us. Pushed right on through. Mm-hmm. So that's Go, the first going thing. Going back, would you, ha- you would have done that differently to I would engage have. your older, your son. I would have. I probably, because I know this, like hindsight was, of course, 2020, but I would have actually researched, um, you know, blended families and step families just to to prepare myself. And also it's comforting in knowing, hey, you're going to, um, you're going to experience these challenges. It's not unique and you're going to make it through, you know, and here are some things that you can do. Um, if I hadn't known that, things would have been better. So, And I would have talked to my son and just tried to find out how he was feeling about it um, because they're kids and they're immature. And he may have had all these thoughts through his, through his head. And I, didn't, I wasn't there to counter them, to right. reassure him, to tell him, no, it's not like this. It's, it's really like this. And this is what our intentions are because I didn't talk to him about it. Other people were talking to him or he kind of came up on his own decision. So I can't blame him all the way for acting out because I just didn't talk to him about it. Well, there's no guarantee that even if you did it perfectly, that it would have been the the outcome you wanted. Because, you you know, God creates us with free will. So you could, I I just want to release you from a little guilt there because sometimes, I mean, I, I was that stepson. I had that stepdad myself and I, I was nine years old. I wasn't too kind to him. And he wasn't too kind to me. 
Right. And that's just the way we settled into our relationship. Mm-hmm. But but I don't know that even if he sat me down and said, Jimmy, you know, here here's the way it is. I don't know that that would have changed my perception because I'm in, immature at that time. Mm-hmm. I've got a lot of wounds and a lot of hurts. You're not my father. So I, you know, I, yeah. I know you, you might want to do it differently. Yeah, of course. So then, of course, it's still, he's going to act the way he wants. I mean, look at me. I, I did what I wanted to do, even though my parents tried. You know, right. So I definitely realized that. Mm-hmm. But to answer your question, it tore me up Yeah. to see um, the conflict in my family. And I had a lot of different emotions from, um, why aren't my kids acting right? My son, you know, because he was definitely disrespectful. Yeah. At the same time, thinking, okay, I don't necessarily like the way Lamar spoke to him. I don't necessarily or the way he liked, disciplined the or kids. the way he disciplined, or I'm not used to having someone else step up and want to discipline my children. And I didn't know I would have those feelings at first. So there was a lot going on. And the key at question is, what'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how did you guys resolve mm-hmm. that? That's classic, right. even in. First time married parenting, mm-hmm. exactly. and this is classic stuff. Where wow, well, you've and, you've and had part, disagreements, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that part right there is is so important because in blended families, it's not that it's different issues going on; the issues are just greatly compounded. Well, that's a good you, way to look you know, at like it. like like teens. Um, if I can say me act crazy, <laughs> um, it doesn't matter what family it's in. Right. But in a blended family, it's just different and compounded. So even yeah. when we you mentioned discipline a while ago, yeah, like I'm much more of the disciplinarian than Ronnie. Well, you're coming from a police military dad. <laughs> right. I I know what no, you're talking right. about. So <laughs> so I'm much more disciplinarian than, than Ronnie may be. And we've talked to a lot of couples that are in just a biological nuclear family, and that's an issue. One of the, the husband or the wife is, is more, you know, in the discipline than the other person is. So with us, it just was compounded because when Ronnie would see me react to the kids, she would always talk about, and I could I could tell, the in some verbally, she would even say sometimes, um, that's just because you don't have any kids, right? Or you're, you're treating my kids this way. When I'm thinking in my head, no, I would probably treat my kids even sterner yeah yeah <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it out. wasn't until we it wasn't until we had children together that she actually saw okay yeah. this is just the way he is it's not he's being mean to my children mm-hmm. right but but she didn't have anything to actually reflect that that's upon. really interesting so i'm not letting letting you off the hook ronnie so how did you feeling like you're caught in the middle how mm-hmm. did you get resolution yeah um it took some time because uh, we didn't handle things um necessarily um the right way initially because we didn't know we didn't we weren't educated and we didn't know some of it was just inside and it would just come out and for as frustrations um a lot of times we you know talk to each other you know behind closed doors not necessarily um in front of the kids like I, you know i didn't like the way you dealt with this with with the kids or i didn't like the way you talked to my son um Ooh. And so, yeah, th- th- uh, those are some of the things that um, I, w- I would say. And, you know, these are good things. These are practical things. This truly is, if you're a parent, you can relate to what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. that is the bottom line. Hey, before we say goodbye, too, let me give you a minute to talk about the ministry, you know, Black and Married with Kids. What's your goal? I mean, our goal um, since we first launched was to provide positive images of marriage and parenting in the African-American community and to draw people closer to the fact, uh, I think what marriage needs is a marketing job. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I I mean, because like I said, most of the time when people say they don't want to get married, it's because of what they've seen. So what we always press upon couples that are out here and that are happily married is we need you to be vocal, to lift your voice, no matter who you are, what cultural background, ethnic background, we need you to lift your voice and be visible because when couples aren't happy, who do they tell? Everyone, whether you want to hear it or not, yeah. whether you know them or not. So we need successful, happy relationships to really promote and share and, you know, put pictures of yourself at date night on Facebook or, you know, <laughs> on social media, on Instagram, whatever it is. Um, share pictures and images of your family so that people know that there are couples that are living out this purpose, that are in the covenant of marriage, that are loving every second of it. Not saying that they're perfect because we get a lot of couples that they get caught up thinking I have to be perfect in order to share my story. Right. But saying that, hey, you know, even though we may have faced difficulties, you know, we prayed about it, we worked through it, we were able to come through the other side, and if we did it, you can too. That's fantastic. Thanks for being such a great model for all of us. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Pat. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.